Um, my name is Liana Birnbaum, and I work at a company called SlideTown. We are the stewards of a project called Spit Inspire that have been recently accepted as sandbox, sandbox projects into the CNCI. So today, I'm going to walk you through uh, Spiffy. Uh, we'll talk about the Spire plugin, uh, how that works, how we use that. Uh, then I'll show you node attestation, workload attestation, how uh, Spire implements that. At that point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Neil Shaw, who has a presentation and a demo uh, that VMware worked with, uh, basically creating uh, node testers for uh, Kerberos. And then we'll just uh, wrap it up for questions. Uh, out of curiosity, did anyone see Andrew Jeffsip's um, Spiffy intro talk yesterday? Anyone? Okay. So I'll, I'll just I'll go over uh, what Spiffy is. So Spiffy is made up of three things: uh, a Spiffy ID, uh, an identity document, and a workload API. <coughs> Uh, so what Spiffy ID is a uh, URI string. Uh, we, uh, Spiffy does not dictate what that URI string should look like, but uh, the domain is what we would call the trust domain of a deployment. Anything that comes after the slash would be the identity of the workload. Um, uh, SVID is an X509 certificate. SVID was the first identity document that the community came up with. Um, what it really does is it describes what goes into an X509 certificate, uh, what extensions we're using for that. And we didn't want to create our own extensions, our own ASN.1 extensions, because we wanted to make SVIDs as consumable as possible. So it would work with uh, most TLS stacks. And um, right now, um, during one of our, um, uh, in six spec, which is uh, our SIG group that works on the Spiffy specification, we are working on uh, job SVIDs. So that's the next uh, identity document that we're putting together that you would use for HTTP based protocols. And then the workload API. So the, uh, the workload API, and the identity documents, you know, we're working with that in the six pack, and that's being led by Evan Gilman, who uh, worked at SiteDown. So if you're interested in participating or seeing what's going on there, we have uh, weekly SIG meetings that you can join. And uh, <coughs> so um, the workload API, we recently just came out with our 1.0 of that, and we implemented a C++ library for that, and created a demo uh, using Nginx, uh, Nginx modules. So we just published a blog post on that, and I'll show you the link of that, but if you look in our uh, uh, Cytel, blog.sitel.io, you'll find that uh, blog post. Now, um, let me just show you what that API looks like. So this is based in, uh, in our Git repo. This is the, the API that we work with with the community. It's a gRPC push API. Um, and w what we have there is, um, so we have the SVIDs that are delivered to a, a calling workload. Um, also the interest, um, federated bundles, which basically means that the workload API will deliver a bag of certs, everything that you need to, uh, to talk to other workloads. And we are also have a space there for a revocation list that we have in our roadmap to implement later on this year. So that not only would you deliver certs, but you would also deliver uh, revocations um, through the API. Just give me one second. Alrighty. Uh, and again, we're working right now on the JOT SVID, which would be the next identity document, and that would have a, a JOT SVID and a spec of what goes into the JOT, plus the API associated with that. Now, Spire. So what Spire is, is our implementation of uh, the Spiffy 
um, runtime environment. So it just it's something that you could use that implements uh, Spiffy. And uh, Spire is made up of two parts, uh, Spire server and a Spire agent. Um, the Spire server does identity mapping, node attestation, S SVID issuance, and the Spire eight, or that was the Spire server. The Spire agent does the workload attestation and the workload API. S um, and the thing to see is that we have APIs and plugins. Uh, the APIs will call on the plugins, and each plugin has a protobuf def definition that also you could find in the GitHub repo. Uh, when we first put out Spire, uh, plugins were um, external processes. Recently, we've changed that, so you could have an external process that you call via gRPC, or you could compile that uh, plug-in into either the Spire server or the Spire agent. <coughs> um, so I'm going to just walk over, I'm going to just go over some of the uh, plugins on each side. So the first one is the node attester. So the node attester is responsible for attesting the identity proof of a node. And they work in conjunction with the node attester on the Spire agent, so they come in pairs. Um, and they're really dependent on the environment that you're running in. So we have one, we have an AWS attester, and we also have a token attester, and what Neil's gonna show is his Kerberos attester that he wrote. Uh, then the node resolver, uh, that will basically discover additional metadata about the attested node. So for instance, uh, for AWS, we will verify the, the node attester will attest the signed metadata for that instance, and the node resolver would basically look and determine you know, what label, um, security group, or AG that, that uh, process is running under. Uh, the CA is responsible for processing CSR requests. Uh, by the Spire agent. It's also responsible for generating CSRs for intermediates, signing certs, and storing the related keys. And the, the upstream CA allows us to integrate with an ex existing PKI system. So you could either run this as um, have the Spire server have a self-signed cert, or you could hook it up and have it be downstream from your, uh, your own PKI if you already have one existing. And then the data store is responsible for providing a registry to store all the workload identities and attestation policies. These are basically the rule sets that you use to assign identities for the, the workloads. <clears throat> and currently um, it's implemented using SQLite and in the roadmap we're gonna have an HA implementation of that. One second. All right, uh, so on the other side of the, the agent is made up of three uh, plugins. So the first plugin is the key manager, and that's responsible for generating uh, the, the CSR request and uh, storing and creating the, the public private key pair for that node. Uh, the node tester is the pair of the node tester on the, on the uh, Spire server, and that's responsible for performing platform specific proof of identity of that node. And then the last piece is the workload attester. So the workload attester is responsible for testing the workload. Uh, when called, it perform you could have multiple selectors, uh, work workload testers associated with that workload. The API will verify and check uh, the attestation policy and use one, one of the workload testers that are associated with that policy. Once the policy is satisfied, uh, the API will deliver the SVID and bundle of um, federated certs to the calling process. So now I'm gonna just walk through this, show what that looks like. So this is basically what the final system looks like after everything has been delivered. Um, so we'll see how we get there. So when you start up, there's nothing there. Um, and the Spire server has to create and generate its um, signing keys for that server. 
Um, it calls a CA. The upstream CA, if that's been configured, at that point, we deliver the intermediate cert that has been signed correctly. That cert has a TTL and is rotated also. Um, now, we're gonna start registering things, so we call the registration API. This is what you use to register the attestation policy, basically the mapping of what selectors you're using um, and what um, spiffy ID that, that relates to. And then it's stored in the data store where it's persisted. Uh, for node attestation, uh, the, now the, um, the node comes up online and uh, so the one thing to note here is that we have preceded that node with the, the bundle of trust from the Spire server. Uh, the node attester runs, basically checks whatever metadata is on that node. Uh, it'll generate a CSR request. Uh, the node API is called. Uh, the node attester on the server side verifies that uh, the signing data, whatever data was passed over is correct. Uh, the node resolver is called after that to see if there's any other data that it could figure out. And then the, it looks it up in the data store. And then we sign the CSR request. At that point, we deliver uh, what we call the base SVID to the calling node. So one thing to point out here is that at this point, we just have an identity for the node. And the workload that runs on that node will have a different identity. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm just trying to make, make, figure out my notes. Uh, so at the same time, what we've also done is we've delivered um, all the attestation policy that's associated with that, with that node to the, to the cache, the local cache on that node. So we're telling it these are the workloads that can run on that, on that node. Now, when the, um, when the node goes to talk to the Spire server again, he's going to use that SVID, and that, you, that SVID will be used by the, by, the, uh, by the server to basically figure out who's talking to it. So we use that to, to map nodes to, uh, to the corresponding uh, entries in the, in the Spire server. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start generating pre-generate certs for the workloads that can run on that, uh, on that node. So, like I said, we've delivered, everything now is cached locally on the, um, on the agent. Um, the node API is called again, and the CSR request was generated from the key manager. It's signed, and then we deliver it back to the, uh, to the node, and he caches it. So the, the whole idea is that You've pre-generated all the identities that are allowed to run on that, on that, on that node. Um, they also have a TTL, so this is constantly being updated and running. And uh, when a workload comes up, it would just, um, once it passes attestation, all its identity would be delivered. So now we go into the workload attestation. So now the workload comes up. Uh, and he talks to... Um, a well-known endpoint for the workload API. At that point, the workload API will attest the calling workload. It will determine if uh, all the criteria in the, in the attestation policy for that workload is, um, is satisfied. And if everything is satisfied, it will deliver the cert to that, to that workload. And now the, the workload has been assigned its identity. Um, so this is basically our guide on how to create these plugins that uh, we've kind of written. So you could just uh, go there and, and see how we did this and create one, which is how uh, Neil did this. And I'm going to hand it off to Neil, where he's going to show us what he did to do uh, Kerberos attestation. Cool. Okay. okay. So I'm going to talk about how we brought Kerberos to microservices with Spire. So I'm Neil, and I work at VMware, and I work in our cloud native apps division, and we collaborated with the Cytale folks to add a Kerberos node tester. 
So I'll go over Kerberos first, a very high-level introduction to what the protocol is and how it works and why it's relevant. And then I'll get into the actual tester and show it off. So Kerberos is a predominant identity stack for enterprise. And most cloud-native workloads don't have an easy way to integrate with the enterprise identity stacks. And because of that, Kerberos is an ideal bootstrap for Spire to you know, attest different nodes in a cloud-native environment. Spire has, does not have a mechanism to use Kerberos as of yet. And with Kerberos support, Spire can manage identities tied very close to existing enterprise infrastructure. The way Kerberos works is it's comprised of at least three different players. The first is a trusted third party known as the Key Distribution Center, or the KDC. The KDC has two services within, an authentication service and a ticket granting service. And I'll get into how they're used in a second. The next player is a server. This server could be for anything, really. And then the last player is a client. And this client is an endpoint in which some user or some other service could use to talk to the resources in the server. Kerberos can be broken down into three main steps. The first step can be called the login step. And during the login step, the user on the client would identify itself to the KDC, the authentication service in particular, and say, hi, I'm Bob. Do you know me? Can I log in? Am I trusted? And once Bob is trusted, then we'll go into the next step, which is the long-lived service ticket step. The KDC, the authentication service, will give Bob what's called a ticket granting ticket, a TGT. And with this ticket, Bob can now talk to the second component of the KDC, the ticket granting service. In, and he can request service tickets or long-lived service tickets to request access to any particular service within this realm. A realm is an environment in which Kerberos operates. Once Bob receives the service ticket, he will then present it to the web server that is hosting the service that Bob wants to access. Then the web server will look at this ticket, and since the server trusts the KDC, it will recognize that this service ticket was signed by its trusted KDC, and therefore it will trust the service ticket, and it will trust that Bob is a user who is allowed to access resources in this realm. Kerberos is typically run within a domain. A domain controller such as Active Directory can really help automate Kerberos management. Whenever you join a computer to a domain, a machine account, which is very similar to a user account, but this account is used to identify the actual computer or the machine that is joined to this domain. And once the machine is joined to a domain, you can use a machine's user account the same way as you would a user account. In Active Directory, the domain is the same thing as a Kerberos realm. So I want to take a tangent for a second and talk about Project Lightwave. Project Lightwave is an open source, multi-tenanted cloud directory service offering from VMware. And it is comprised of you know, directory service that's LDAP compliant, uh, Kerberos KDC, and uh, it supports a bunch of different authentication services, such as OAuth, OIDC, SAML. We have our own certificate authority. And we also have our own DNS server that is um, tied very closely to Kerberos as well. And in Lightwave, all of the different authentication services that we support come together and converge in our directory service with Kerberos. It's Apache 2.0 licensed, and you can check it out from that GitHub link up there. But for the rest of this presentation, whenever I refer to domains or the KDC, I'll be referring to Lightwave, as that's what we base the rest of our work on. Let's get straight into node attestation with Kerberos now. So, as Emiliano mentioned, whenever a node agent first comes up, it will talk to the Spire control plane and say, hi, I'm a node, do you know me? And if this node hasn't been attested before, then the server will respond back saying, I don't know, you need to attest yourself. And it will say, I support all these attestation methods. And a node can be configured to use a particular attestation method, in this case, Kerberos. Then once it receives that uh, request from the control plane, it will start node attestation. If you remember, the first step is login, which is what the node agent will do. It will talk to the Lightwave KDC, and it will then get the long-lived long session ticket from that login TGT that was returned to it. Then it would use that TGT to get this long-lived service ticket, 
And once it has the service ticket, it can then present that service ticket back to the Spire control plane, the node agent server there. And then the node agent server will validate the service ticket that's presented to it. Once this ticket has been validated, it can do additional node lookups and process selector lookups. And with that information, once it has everything it needs, it will then respond to the node agent with the Swiffy ID for it. This is a bird's eye view of the demo now. On the left-hand side, we have the Spire server. And the Spire server is also a domain controller. And this domain controller is running the Kerberos node tester server as well. And on the right-hand side, we have the Spire agent. The Spire agent is another VM that is domain joined to the Lightwave domain that's, on, that's run from the Spire server. And that's where the Spire agent will be running. And the node tester agent will be running there. Once the Spire agent has been attested, we will then create or register a new workload that can be run on this host. And this will just be a Unix workload. And then once the workload is registered, we can then simulate the workload API to show that it is getting the correct identity after it has been attested. OK. Let me zoom in a little. Is this good? Can everybody see it well? Cool. So this, this window is the Spire server, the control plane. And if we look at if you look at Lightwave's utility to retrieve you know, the domain state, we can see that this is indeed the controller. And if I flip to my other window here, we can do the same command. And we can see that this guy is a client that is joined to the domain. So if I go back to the domain controller, the Spire server, we can now start Spire. We can see here that Spire server is now running. And if we take a look at the output from the server, we can see that the Kerberos node tester has been loaded and it is running now. If you go back to the agent, and we can start the Spire agent here. And as soon as the Spire agent runs, it will start node attestation with Kerberos because our plugin configuration has been set to use the Kerberos attester. So if I hit run here, we can see that no pre-existing SWID was found will perform node attestation. So if we go back to the Spire server, we can see that we, we got a CSR for the client host, the agent host, and we attested it through the Kerberos attester. If we take a look in the server at our directory service logs, we can see, oh, sorry. we can see that the Kerberos handshake was actually performed. We can see how the first step here, which is login, the agent hostname, pdev go to, was logged in. And then that same host tried to request a long-lived service ticket for the server, which is pdev-go. Once this <coughs> node has attested itself, we can register a workload for that host from the server. We're saying here that on this particular host, the agent that we just attested through Kerberos, we want to register this workload for a name, Neil. So that's the username of the workload, or the name of the workload. And the selector is a Unix UID. And that's the UID of the user, Neil, on that other host. So if I create this, a workload has been associated to this node. And if we see here in the server, we signed an SVID for that workload on that node. If we go back to that node now, we see that we actually received the SVID for that workload that we just registered. To verify that my UID is indeed 1002, we can see that here. 
And then the next thing we can do is we can simulate the workload API by calling the Spire agent API to fetch the workload's information, the identity information for that workload. Mm -hmm. And we can do that as, my, as the user, Neil, that we associated the ID to. We can see that once we ran that command, we received a cert bundle that contains the spiffy ID for the particular workload, which is my user. And we can also see from the agent's output that we attested this one process, and the selectors found associated to that process were a Unix UID, and the UID matches. And to verify, we can take a look at the certificate that was given to us from running that command. And if you look at the X509 cert in the subject alternate name field, we see that the URI matches the workload, the spiffy ID for the workload for my user, Neil. And that is Spire working. <laughs> and if you want to check a take a look at the Kerberos Attester code, it's on GitHub. Let me put this back on presenter view. And yeah, you can go poke around at it there, and there's a link to Lightwave and the operating system that we ran it all on, Photon OS, which is also another offering from VMware. That's great. Um, so uh, did you have the link for the, for the code, too, for the, let me just see that, because you basically, yeah, yeah so the, the Kerberosa tester, so that's where all that code is, and mm -hmm. that's using, that, that's getting called out of band as a, via gRPC. Mm -hmm. Um, so just for us, then, uh, these are the places, uh, the, the repos that a lot of this code lives. Uh, spiffy Spiffy is the specification. Spire is, uh, is the uh, Spire code. And Spiffy example, uh, what, what we do is every month or two months, we put out an example showing uh, the current state of the, of the system. The last one we did was using Nginx with the with uh, support for the workload API, uh, 1.0. Uh, and again, there's a blog post associated with that. I, you should go check it out. Um, and uh, you know, previously we, we did this with Envoy and Ghost Tunnel, which is a proxy out of the, the team at Square. And then um, our Slack channel. And uh, that is the blog post. And Oh, should I go back? I don't know. Do you want a picture? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just go to so that's blogs. I tell IO. Uh, questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in the back. Uh, so could, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I didn't, I didn't hear you. I, Yes. Right. So, if I if I could paraphrase, you're saying uh, Kerberos is was invented many years ago before today's current um, architectures, yeah. and with NATs on the network. I, do you want to answer that, or maybe uh, Krishna? Yeah. I, I don't know if you wanna sure. One second. So actually, you're quite correct. It's still that you have to be on a, you have to be within a routable network. So client, server, and KDC will all have to be on the same network. On the MIT KDC, on the MIT Curb stuff, there's actually a feature that allows you to ignore that notion of basically saying you have to be on the network. But in general, you're absolutely right. We always are um, on the same routable network. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So for the Kerberos um, OS station to work, you still need to bootstrap the node with the key tab, I guess. Yes. Do you have an automated solution for that? Yes. Or yes. So that, that's the notion of the... Sure, sure. The, qu the question was, for Kerberos as a station to work, you would still need to bootstrap the node to have a Kerberos key tab or a Kerberos configuration set on it. And, and the, the answer to that is, 
it is automated through domain controllers and the concept of a domain. So for Lightwave, for example, and for Active Directory as well, whenever you join a host to a domain, the key tab in the Kerberos configuration is automatically placed on that node. So that is automated there. And that's what I meant by domain controllers and the notion of a domain really automates Kerberos deployments and management. Right, but in order to join, you still need some sort of OPP or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is it open source? Yes. Yes. Everything we have. Actually, I don't have a loud voice. But, um, <laughs> um, you, you actually described it exactly uh, the way we actually do it too, as well. So you, we, um, one of the things you do in Kerberos is uh, you have the domain controller, and basically then you have accounts that are authorized to actually perform domain join, uh, to perform a domain join. Because you really don't want to use your domain administrator's credential to do the domain join. So you want to have a, a delegated ordinary user who has the only rights to actually say, join machines in. So that's one level of security you already get in. And you actually described it just perfectly the way we actually do it internally. So mm -hmm. what we do in uh, VMware is um, we basically um, use um, um, Lightway, but Lightway also supports OAuth as well. You know, he talked about, Neil talked about convergence of OAuth and Kerberos because we treat the, we, we, we unify, we converge the identity. What a client registration is, is a service principle for us. We do that. That's one, we do that. And then we absolutely, exactly do, I can't, I can't even say it as well as you just did, which is we actually have this notion of a script which takes this one-time password and then sort of auto-joins the system in. And we, mm -hmm. have, we provide the APIs to do this. So. That's kind of the way the works. And this is not a, this is not a pitch for lightway, but you know the code's out there. You guys can talk, take a look at it if you want. Uh, any other questions? Oh. Okay. Yeah, I come to create a key tab file. Is it? Uh, true that it has to be regenerated when you change the password. Okay, so how do you manage that? Sorry. <laughs> could you, could you, I, I didn't hear the question that well. Yeah, sorry, I just didn't hear the question that well. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, probably know your Active Directory quite well, but what happens is, um, you know, one of the points again, um, I'm so sort of uh, blown away with Spiffy because for me, I'm an old Kerberos hand, and the way I look at Spiffy is, Spiffy is sort of modernizing, sort of, it's the perfect hybrid. It's ex it's like Kerberizing. Sorry, how do I say this well? It's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I haven't answered your question. So well, let me answer your question first. Um, what happens is on every uh, node you actually have a daemon running, and what um, and so we make this available. So the source code, we make this so clients have a, a, a daemon running on it too, and this daemon is something we call the AFD daemon. And what the AFD daemon does is it manages once you do the domain join, it's managing its Kerberos key tab, right? So what it does right now is it is like a security principle and it is a client to the directory service. So what it does is it scans the directory periodically and on the top of the directory is the domain policy object. And on the domain policy object, we tell you how, what the default policy is to sort of refresh your machine password. And so periodically we're tracking that and we're saying, okay, 30 days up and the default typically in an active directory environment is 30 days. We track it, you can configure it there, and then we'll auto refresh and we'll do the change password for you. And we'll regenerate the fresh key tab file for you. So we take care of that. Right. I, I, I think I can, I think I make it, maybe I can shout. Ah, okay. So, so but, but what does this uh, spiffy stuff then give if, if that Kerberos doesn't already do if you encode your service principle name like a path or something? I, I, that's still sort of the thing with 
with all of this, whenever something something like this shows up, it's just like it's a, a re-implementation of Kerberos. Well, not really. And so I'm a huge Kerberos. I'm an old-time Kerberos uh, guy, and so I can tell you why I think Spiffy is kind of um, really quite elegant. Um, the concepts are very similar. I mean, the first concept that probably Kerberos put in place was the notion of a UPN or a service principal name. And basically what that means is whether you're a service, whether you're a user, or whether, you know, whether you're a human user, or whether you're a service, um, fundamentally naming is a key part of it. And what you have out there is this notion of, in a cloud native world, you have this notion of a name. That's point number one that Spiffy gives you. The second thing that Spiffy does, which basically is what Kerberos, Kerberos was always built around usernames and passwords, right? And you have to realize those days are long gone, and you, that's not secure. And so what Spiffy does, which I think is also really elegant, it's moved you away from a symmetric key system into PKI, right? And so that's point number two I'm going to put there. The problem with PKI in, PKI in the old world is that PKI never had, in any of the X509 world, PKI never had a model in which you could handle the things that Kerberos could do. You didn't have the equivalent of an MIT Kerberos API or like the one that, and the only other one which really did the automation of Kerberos, you know, it's ironic, but Kerberos came from MIT, but the people who made it the most widespread entity in the world was Microsoft, a closed environment, right? And what did they do? They provided APIs around Kerberos, right? With the Windows distributed systems APIs. And sort of what I think Spiffy does is it sort of marries that world of a Kerberos style system using an asymmetric key model, a PKI model. And that is, I think, it's well over, a time well overdue that we actually do this. So I think that is a, that is a relevant, uh, th that's the kind of really cool thing that's come about. Oh, and by the way, it breaks this whole, the, uh, the IP address problem doesn't exist. So. I think we're uh, pretty uh, short in time yeah. now. Uh, next time we'll put Krishna as one of the presenters yeah. too. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>